Anijayek. Welcome back to Indigenous Author Monday and we are in our fifth episode of our braiding sweetgrass series. You should all have your braiding sweetgrass books by now. You can get at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and milkweed.org. So now we're into the chapter learning the grammar of animacy and we're starting on page 48. To be native to a place, we must learn to speak its language. This is very important in so many reasons. I'd like to know what your reasons are for why you believe that statement is true for you. To be native to a place, we must learn to speak its language. I come here to listen, to nestle in the curve of its roots in a soft hollow of pine needles to lean my bones against the column of white pine, to turn off the voice in my head until I can hear the voices outside it, the shh of wind in needles, water trickling over rock, nutch hatch tapping, chipmunks digging, beech nut falling, mosquito in my ear, and something more, something that is not me, for which we have no language, the world wordless being of others, in which we are never alone. After the drumbeat of my mother's heart, this was my first language. When I first read that, that made me tear up a little bit. Um, because we all know what our mother's heartbeats sound like from the inside. And this was acknowledging that. After the drumbeat of my mother's heart, this was my first language. I could spend a whole day listening, and a whole night, and in the morning, without my hearing it, there might be a mushroom that was not there the night before, creamy white, pushed up from the pine needle duff, out of darkness to light, still glistening with the fluid of its passage. Pahawi, Papawi. Listening in wild places, we are audience to conversations in language not our own. I think now that it was a longing to comprehend this language I hear in the woods that led me to science, to learn over the years to speak fluent botany, a tongue that should not, by the way, be mistaken for the language of plants. I did learn another language in science, though, one of careful observation, an, in, an intimate vocabulary that names each little part to name and describe you must first see, and science polishes the gift of seeing. I honor the strength of the language that has become a second language to me, but beneath the richness of its vocabulary and its descriptive power, something is missing. The same something that swells around you and in you when you listen to the world. Science can be a language of distance which reduces a being to its working parts. It is a language of objects. The language scientists speak, however precise, is based on a profound error in grammar, an omission, a grave loss in translation. My first taste of the missing language was the word papawi on my tongue. I stumbled upon it in a book by the Anishinaabe ethnobotanist Kiwe in a treat treatise on the traditional use of fungi by our people. Papawi, she explained, translates as the force which causes mushrooms to push up from the earth overnight. As a biologist, I was stunned that such a word existed. In all its technical vocabulary, Western science has no such term, no words to hold this mystery. You'd think that biologists, of all people, would have words for life. But in scientific language, our terminology is used to define the boundaries of our knowing. What lies beyond our grasp remains unnamed. Part, this part I felt was really important for us to go over um, because our native language is so close to how we view things as well as their function. For example, the word Manitou, um, often in English, it tr people will translate it to it means spirit, like Gitche Manitou means great spirit, but that's not quite correct. 
Gitchy means great, yes. But Manitou is more than a spirit. It's the essence of, of, of being, of spirit, of life. Um, so it's like all of the above. So Gitchy Manitou isn't just great spirit. He's great or it's great everything. The breath, the spirit. So there's even an island where people are from, Manitouan Island. And in English translates, oh, it's the spirit island, but it's not, that's not quite it. Manitoulin Island is the island of life, of breath, of spirit, of things we don't understand, of creation, and everything in between. So our words in our native language are really important when we look at them because they will describe more than, and a lot of times is almost impossible to explain in English words. It comes from the heart. It comes from the being. So this part was really important to me because she pinpoints exactly the issue between modern day science and Latin words and our true essence of language. And in this next passage, she explains it a little bit more. In the three syllables of this new word, I could see an entire process of close observation. In the damp morning was the formulation of a theory for which English has no equivalent. The makers of this word understood a world of being full of unseen energies that animate everything. I've cherished it for many years as a talisman and longed for the people who gave a name to the life force of mushrooms. The language that holds Papawi is one that I wanted to speak. So when I learned that the word for rising, for emergence, belonged to the language of my ancestors, it became a signpost for me. So here she, she explains it more that a word means so much more than the English translation. So we have to pay attention to that, don't we? Had history been different, I would likely speak Bodwe Watomian or Potawatomi as an Anishinaabe language. But like many of the 350 indigenous languages of the Americas, Potawatomi is threatened, and I speak the language you read. The powers of assimilation did their work, as my chance of hearing that language, and yours too, was washed from the mouths of Indian children in governmental boarding schools, where speaking your native tongue was forbidden. Children like my grandfather, who was taken from his family when he was just a little boy of nine years old. This history scattered not only our words, but also our people. Today I live far from our reservation, so even if I could speak the language, I would have no one to talk to. But a few summers ago, at our yearly tribal gathering, a language class was held, and I slipped into the tent to listen. I know exactly what, what class she's talking about here. And I am really happy to say that our language is coming back. Our language program in our tribe and our band is amazing. And we now have a tribal dictionary and we have an app that we can learn the language in and recording so that we can hear it phonetically. So we're coming a long way. Books are being um, written and sold in our in Bodwe Watamian language. So we're getting there. And Potawatomi isn't the only tribe that's doing this. Every tribe across the board is doing this. We have seen and our tribal elders have screamed to us in a way how important it is to know our language because they aren't just words. They aren't just sounds. They explain what we need to know about life and where we come from. So our language, super important, and it's coming back. Moving on. Now she, she's talking about the class, the language class that she's in. And I feel like this is an important part for us to read and um, think about and discuss. A man with long gray braids tells how his mother hid him away when the Indian agents came to take the children. He escaped boarding school by hiding under an overhang, an overhung bank 
for the sound of the stream covered his crying. The others were all taken and had their mouths washed out with soap or worse for talking that dirty Indian language because he alone stayed home and was raised up calling the plants and animals by the name creator gave them. He is here today, a carrier of the language. The engines of assimilation worked well. The speaker's eyes blaze as he tells us, we are the end of the road. We are all that is left. If you young people do not learn the language, the language will die. The missionaries and the U.S. government will have their victory at last. A great grandmother from the circle pushes her walker up close to the microphone. It's not just the words that will be lost, she says. The language is the heart of our culture. It holds our thoughts, our way of seeing the world. It's too beautiful for English to explain. Papawi. Jim Thunder, at 75, the youngest of the speakers, is a round brown man of serious demeanor who spoke only in Potawatomi. He began solemnly, but as he warmed to his subject, his voice lifted like a breeze in the birch trees and his hands began to tell the story. He became more and more animated, rising to his feet holding as rapt and silent, although almost no one understood a single word. He paused as if reaching the climax of his story and looked out at the audience with a twinkle of expectation. One of the grandmothers behind him covered her mouth in a giggle and his stern face suddenly broke into a smile as big and sweet as a cracked watermelon. He bent over laughing and the grandmas dabbed away tears of laughter, holding their sides while the rest of us looked on in wonderment. When the laughter subsided, he spoke at last in English. What will happen to a joke when no one can hear it anymore? How lonely those words will be when their power is gone. Where will they go? Off to join the stories that can never be told again. So now my house is spangled with post-it notes in other language, as if I were studying for a trip abroad, but I'm not going away. I'm coming home. Okay, now moving on to the next chapter of the Maple Sugar Moon, there's this sweet excerpt, um, Tending Sweetgrass. Wild meadow sweetgrass grows long and fragrant when it is looked after by humans. Weeding and care for the habitat and neighboring plants strengthen its growth. Maple Sugar Moon. When Nanabosho, the Anishinaabe original man, our teacher, part man, part Manitou, walked through the world, he took note of who was flourishing and who was not, of who was mindful of the original instructions and who was not. He was dismayed when he came upon a village where the gardens were not being tended, where the fish nets were not repaired and the children were not being taught the way to live. Instead of seeing piles of firewood and caches of corn, he found the people lying beneath the maple trees with their mouth wide open, catching the thick sweet syrup of the generous trees. They had become lazy and took for granted the gifts of the creator. They did not do their ceremonies or care for one another. He knew his responsibility, so he went to the river and dipped up many buckets of water. He poured the water straight into the maple trees to dilute the syrup. Today, maple sap flows like a stream of water with only a trace of sweetness to remind the people both of possibility and of responsibility. And so it is that it takes 40 gallons of sap to make a gallon of syrup. That's true, we tap our maple trees here when the weather is right, and it takes a lot of the sap um, to make the syrup. If any of you have tapped maple trees, it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work. And you can drink the water, the sap that comes right out, it tastes like just sweet, sweet water. 
Um, so it's great, but to get this, the sticky syrup, you have to boil it down and let it evaporate until you just have the, the golden liquid. So I wanna finish with this reading. It's on page 70. We're getting there. Um, let's see. I hardly noticed the sky silver as the maple sugar moon rose in the east. So bright on a clear freezing night, it threw tree shadows against the house. Bold black embroidery around the windows where the girls lay sleeping, the shadows of the twin trees. These two perfectly matched in girth and form stand centered in front of the house by the edge of the road. Their shadows framing the front doors like dark columns of maple portico. They rise in unison without a branch until they reach the roof line where they spread like an umbrella. They grew up with this house shaped by its protection. There was a custom in the mid 1800s of planting twin trees to celebrate a marriage and the starting of a home. The stance of these two just 10 feet apart recalls a couple standing together on the porch steps holding hands the reach of their shade links the front porch with the barn across the road, reaching a shady path of back and forth for that young family. I realized that those first homesteaders were not the beneficiaries of that shade, at least not as a young couple. They must have meant for their people to stay here. Surely those two were sleeping up on Cemetery Road long before the shade arched across the, the road. I am living today in the shady futures they imagined drinking sap from trees planted with their wedding vows. They could not have imagined me many generations later, and yet I live in the gift of their care. Could they have imagined that when my daughter, Lyndon, was married, she would choose leaves of maple sugar for the wedding giveaway. Such a responsibility I have to these people and these trees left to me, an unknown come to live under the guardianship of the twins with a bond physical, emotional, and spiritual. I have no way to pay them back. Their gift to me is far greater than I have the ability to reciprocate. They're so huge and to be nearly beyond my care, although I do scatter granules of fertilizer at their feet and turn the hose on them in the summer drought. Perhaps all I can do is love them. All I know to do is to leave another gift for them and for the future. Those next unknown who will live here. I heard once that Maori people make beautiful wood sculptures that they carry long distance into the forest and leave there as a gift to the trees. And so I plant daffodils, hundreds of them, in sunny flocks beneath the maples, in homage to their beauty and in re reciprocity for their gifts. Even now, as the sap rises, so too the daffodils rise underfoot. I think that's a good place to stop. So we'll be stopping at page 72 and we will talk about witch hazel, one of my favorite herbs next time. I'd really like to know your thoughts on these two chapters on the language and its importance as well as the relationship between words and plants and objects. Um, and I'd also like to know what you think about maple tapping. Do you guys tap where you are? Have you ever experienced that? It's a lot of fun. Um, and you can get lessons and everything. So I hope to hear what you thought of these two chapters. And yeah, drop them in the comments and let's have a discussion. Have a wonderful week. Stay warm, stay safe. Remember your prayers. Um, this is a hard time for everybody. And so I hope you're all doing well, and I'm praying for you every morning. And we'll see you next Monday. Bama P.
For every Indigenous Author Monday video that I put out, I am dedicating it to the One Shelf Project put on by Gadakana. Gadakana is an Indigenous organization, a 501c3 nonprofit, tax deductible organization that provides books in their local libraries that are actually accurate, historically accurate, and by Indigenous authors both fiction and nonfiction. And their goal is to at least have a shelf dedicated to indigenous accurate information in their local libraries. They can only do this with help through donors and they need your help. I will put the link down here. So please check them out. The One Shelf Project, another organization near and dear to my heart, Gadakana.